winning the battle. Friction is often a pain in the neck, as we all know. Friction causes wear, it causes tear, and it costs fuel. It's a car, there's a lot of friction with the road. You pay for that, and people try to reduce friction with bearings and with lubrication. Oil. Water is an amazing lubricant. If it starts raining, and there's a little bit of dust on the road, the friction coefficient between your tires and the road can become so low that you begin to hydroplane, and that you literally, whoosh, that your friction coefficient goes almost to zero. It happened to me once, and it's no fun. It can happen instantaneously, particularly when the rain begins, in the very early part of the rain, when the road is dusty, so you get the water with a little bit of dust mixed. It's a very dangerous situation. At home, I have a pen. This is my pen at home. Actually, I have more than one pen at home, believe me. But this is a very special pen. And what is special about it is something that I discovered purely by accident. And I want to share with you this um, remarkable pen. You see, when I rotate this cover, a lot of friction, you can hear it. And it stops. You can hear it, right? And so one evening I was boiling potatoes, and I was looking at this pan, and I walked up to it because I wanted to check the potatoes, and I touched this thing, and there was no friction. It just went spinning and spinning and spinning. I couldn't believe my eyes until I realized what is happening. Water had accumulated in the rim of this pan, and the cover was beginning to hydroplane. I'm putting water in it now. You almost don't hear it anymore. Isn't that amazing? almost frictionless. So now the water acts like a lubricant and you try it with your pen, it won't work. <laughs> you need just the right shape, you need the right edge to um, be able to lubricate it that way. In, there are many experiments that are done and many attempts have been made by people to reduce friction. You try if you can, to avoid contact between two surfaces. That you can do by putting a lubricant in between. But even better, it would be if you could separate the objects completely and only have air in between them. Because air has much less friction than a liquid. And that has been done with great success. People use hovercrafts. So they blow air out from below, so the craft lifts itself up, and now it's no longer in contact with the water. It's above the water. So if it moves now, all it has to overcome is the air friction. And that's it. And that helps tremendously. You will be seeing in this lecture hall many demonstrations that I will be doing in the future with what, is what I call an, an air track. I will show it to you in a minute. It is a long, call it a bar for now, cross-section is a triangular shape. And there are holes in here. And we blow air out of that. And on top of that are devices which have been specially designed to perfectly fit this triangle. And when you start blowing the air, they are lifted up, so they float. And so now when you give them a little tap, they can move almost, not quite, but almost without friction. Here is one, a lot of friction. Now I'll turn on the air. Look at the difference. Isn't that amazing? It's floating on its own air cushion. And if I turn it off, the moment that the air stops, you will see it stops. So this is a technique that is often used to do demonstrations, if you have to do them, 
uh, with a minimum of friction. Of course, you could do experiments in the shuttle very well, where you have, again, only air around you. But that's, of course, a very expensive way. In 26100, we will use the air track when we start colliding objects and try to see what happens before and after the collision. There is another device which is very intriguing, and that also acts on the idea that it lifts itself up as a result of gas which is flowing out. In this case, it's a container of carbon dioxide. There's carbon dioxide in here, which is solid, and there is a small opening here, and this is an extremely well-machined flat surface, very flat. And the whole thing rests on an extremely flat surface. Because of the room temperature, the carbon dioxide will start to evaporate and will start to flow out. And therefore, under this thing comes a film, a very thin layer of carbon dioxide. And now you can move this around in two dimensions. You're not stuck like you are there to one dimension, only going back and forth on what we call the air track. But now you can move it around over this whole surface. And that allows you to do very interesting things, as I want to show you next. First make it dark. And we fill that can with dry ice, that is, solid carbon dioxide. Now you know solid carbon dioxide is very cold. This white stuff is just frost that's gathered on the outside of the can. Now as the can absorbs heat from the room, the carbon dioxide evaporates and turns into a gas. The gas takes up more room than the solid, so it has to go somewhere. It can't come out the top, so it comes out a little hole here in the bottom of the disc. Now you can't see it coming out the hole, but if I make a flame, I think you can see that there's gas coming out and blowing the flame. Now if we put the disc with its stream of gas coming out the bottom down on our table top, which is made of a very smooth piece of plate glass, we can wait a moment while the gas coming out builds up pressure underneath, which it has to do in order to escape. By now the disc is floating on this film of escaping gas. That film is so thin that I'm sure you can't see it from out there. I can scarcely see the thick, see a space between the disc and the glass myself. But if you'll come and look over my shoulder, I think I can show you that there is a space. By slipping underneath the disc, this piece of tin foil, I took off a chewing gum wrapper. Now we'll slip the tin foil between the disc and the plate glass top of the table, showing that there is indeed a space, a thin film of gas, between the disc and the, the glass upon which it's resting. The purpose of this is simply to reduce the friction to a point where we won't have to worry about it or measure it in our experiments today. It's fun to play with this thing. Let me show you. I'll give it a little push, just a little one. And there it goes, moving sedately. No sign of slowing up. Come on back. Same thing the other direction. It takes only a very tiny force to start it in motion. Let me show you that.
So you see, fleas are good for something. Have a good weekend. See you Monday.